Welcome to the Neophytes of Narratology, the internet's most pretentious and pseudo-intellectual pursuit since, perhaps, Nietzsche's thus podcast, Zarathustra, or Camus' renowned vlog of Sisyphus. While lesser men aspire to stand on the shoulders of mere giants, we at the Lost Signals will accept nothing less than titans. So join us as we delve into the fundamentals of narrative nuance and critique the critics who proclaim to know the universal qualities of effective storytelling. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Neophytes of Narratology. I'm Jonathan Ian Manzer, here with Scott Thurla. Hello. And Stephen Ramosi. Hello. Today is our first viewer request, Noel Carroll's work, Narrative Closure. Now, the viewer who requested it was Scott. Yes, we have to give a shout out to, I'm um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it or interpreting it wrong, but his his username on our channel was commented on by PKR Bar Movie, capital B and M in Bar Movie. So he suggested, it, actually he suggested a different work, which was originally in French and we could not get a translation of. So he suggested this piece instead. So we read through it at the his request, and we will discuss it henceforth. Now, I would like to, with discussing kind of the, the interaction we have with uh, our viewers, uh, the few of who exist, we've actually gotten some decent feedback on our Susan Sontag episode of Against Interpretation. So anyone who wishes to request a work, perhaps give a response, uh, whether it's in a article or a video recording or audio recording we will happily like if we find it up to par we'll happily host it on our site and we want to have this interaction or leave comments subscribe all that kind of standard issue things but i like the dialogue uh, the philosophical dialogue that we we're trying to build i think we have a good kind of groundwork here and we can improve upon that mm -hmm. but let's dive in um would anyone like to start with a kind of brief synopsis of what this work is about? Uh, I'll try. We, we can basically just read out um, his abstract if you want, but that might be a little bit boring. So essentially, uh, Carol tries to lay out a definition of narrative closure as a term and as applied to philosophy and what it means to for a work to have that and how it can achieve that uh, in, in his view, of course. And he, yeah, he takes on his critics a little bit here and there, but he basically lays, lays out a framework of what he defines it as such and what elements contain it within it and what works have it and use it well and what works don't. Now, to give a little background here, uh, Noah Carroll is a American philosopher, uh, teaches at SUNY, and he's known for his focus on uh, narrative, on film, and on art. Yep. So he has a background. He's done a lot of work. This is actually – this work is building off of Previous this concept stuff. of ca sure. like causation in mm. uh, as an element for narrative. So in the introduction, he discusses what is closure as a concept or uh, his idea of narrative yeah. closure, as, as I said, which is different than the kind of the common usage of it, uh, which is the basically the idea that every question that arises in a work – should be answered by the end of the story. And he discusses that it's almost unnecessary for every single narrative to have this. It's a satisfactory condition, not a necessary condition for a narrative work. Right, yeah. So I right. have that um, highlighted, actually. He says, Therefore, closure is neither unique to narrative, nor is it a feature of all narratives. Inasmuch as closure does not represent a sufficient condition for narrative, we will need to speak more precisely of narrative closure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's basically, as you said, it's not... 100% always the case, but in cases in what does apply, he delves into that more fully. Right. He, he gives examples of like a, a, um, a history. Right. I believe he does the history of India, which is that – or any ongoing plot, whether it's a soap opera, whether it's a history, where there is no definitive endpoint. I mildly disagree with him on this, that I think that any narrative – if if you're writing a history in the style of a narrative, which is telling a story, you are taking a slice. Yes, there are. Yes, but that's a style of, and not just a history. Yeah, but, that's, but, how, that's why I took his point to mean as all. Well. Yeah, to, but to jump into a later point with micro versus macro, mm -hmm. it's all it, the the story. Although it might not solve the macro issues, 
always solves the micro issues sure. brought up during that narrative for an ongoing series. A soap opera, for instance, or whether any TV show with an ongoing narrative has to wrap up the plot points it starts in that episode or w- over a course of a two-part episode or something like sure. that. Or it fails as a uh, as a proper narrative. But not necessarily. I know there's a lot of, um, especially in terms of soap operas, there are a lot of loose ends that never get tied up. And I think that's one of his points, you know, like for these soap operas that have been going on for 60 years, it started on radio and like are still continuing. There are a lot of things that are never going to be answered that there are a lot of questions asked that are never going to be answered. And that's kind of the idea of closure, I think, is what he's trying to say is to answer the questions that have been asked. So I think yes. his the entire idea of this is that while there are some forms of narrative that don't necessarily need closure, there are also... Uh, is it's such it's such an ingrained thing in storytelling that uh, there are enough forms of stories that do need closure that require closure that it's something worth talking about and getting and discussing. Now, in the beginning of uh, the last point in the introduction that I want to discuss is sort of what I'm going to call the Goldilocks point, mm-hmm. which his kind of definition of closure is that there it, stories are constantly ongoing. So there's a point which fits the end of the narrative. You can discuss what happens to a character after the narrative, but if it doesn't tie into the original points, you've gone too far. But if you stop too short, you, then it's unresolved. You know, it's it's unresolved. unresolved. Sure. So yeah, there's that. No, I agree with that. A happy medium yeah. for an ending there. He's absolutely right. When you when you close off the questions that have been asked, I think that that is the point where you have met the requirements for having closure, it's probably the point where you should end your story. Sure, and I mean, he's going to delve into that like more specifically yeah. as specific examples and of other works that have also made that broad point. But I do think that some stories don't quite understand this at the end of them, where they're like, they, sure, well, he they'll makes start that case. another line, you know, without closing it, and then just leave it off, and that's the end of the story. Well, I actually think a great example of this in modern day is the last Lord of the Rings movie, mm-hmm. which got criticized mm-hmm. for ending too many times. But that's the point is <laughs> sure. they had their closure and then continued on giving you what happened afterwards. And mm-hmm. yes, that's like I, I understand why they would do that, but I also understand the complaints now, especially through reading this, where that I got thing. my closure already. Now you're just feeding me more information that I was not necessarily extraneous information, yeah. or perhaps can be sure. So is there any more points on the introduction? No, I mean, it was a pretty well done introduction. It was very clear what he was trying to get at, and he tells you how he's going to arrive at it, at the points he wants to. So That's a lot of what I really like about this paper is it's clear, concise. Yes, exactly. I agree with that. Obtuse. It was very well done, well put together. Yeah. Okay, so we're moving on to the second part, which is the theory of narrative enclosure. Which he actually is where he defines really what it defines is. what yeah. it is. So he begins this by talking about uh, by referencing Aristotle and Hume, at, uh, kind of backing up his points through their early work, right. specifically Aristotle, which we did in an earlier episode, Poetics. Yes, and um, which I, I, just as a quick brief aside, I told Ian he would enjoy this essay because it seems that uh, Carol is very much in line with Aristotle's thinking, which mm-hmm. you are as well. Yes. Or at least references him enough. Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to call what he says is the narrative of promise. It is establishing it, whether it's straightforward like a mystery or whether it's implied uh, points. It's promising the audience that they will receive the answers looking for at the end. Mm-hmm. Right. And that is, in fact, closure. I, I kind of – to reference to a TED Talk we will be releasing in the near future – Oh, who's the guy? Uh, Scott McCloud? No, the other one. Uh, Andrew Stanton. Stanton. Who is discussing about the need to trick the audience into doing work, in a sense, mm-hmm. right. because it gives them satisfaction. Uh, I feel it's a similar thing. It's not spelling out the answers, but providing kind a of. mystery and a curiosity throughout. I agree. It may not be a one-to-one ratio, but certainly you're sort of, if not tricking the audience, at least when, when done well, a any story or a narrative will... Contain an element that sort of the audience gets it as and they feel as if they've arrived there on their own, even if the story itself outright answered it for them. 
it does it it performs the, that that trick if you will so that they arrive at either a narrative conclusion or some other part of the story in which it sort of it sort of it feels like a reveal mm -hmm. to them so yeah that's yeah, all i have to say and, about that I, I think a big part of this section as well is the idea that you have to 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 incite interest in a person you have to kind of string them along for a while and that's that's what he's talking about when he mentions uh David Hume's I guess article or book of tragedy where he says uh, had you any intention to move a person extremely by the narration of any event the best method of increasing its effect would be artfully to delay informing him of it yes which i thought was you know it, it's basically how to tell a good story yeah, more or less it's, it's something that you know is kind of obvious but also well put to point out and like have that be a point of be a point of this section of his uh of his article yes he uses that hume quote and he uses another one the one that i went, uh, liked more probably a bit later on where he writes hume calls what the audience wishes to know quote the secret which is sort of what we get at. and he also referenced bars himself who uh, has done a Z, that Bars calls it more grandiosely an enigma. But regardless of terminology, it's it, it's basically what we just said. It's presenting that to an audience, either explicitly or implicitly, but it's the thing that is going to be answered or revealed, if you will. And I'm sure it's it was more grandiosely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the one thing I really found interesting was his divisions of... I'm a, I'm a big fan of like philosophical scope and analyzing... like macro and micro mm -hmm. aspects of anything when you're dealing with it. And he deals with, uh, addresses three types of this scope. Macro, micro, and presiding macro. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was interesting was his argument is that you have your initial presiding macro question. And, and he, I would say, argues that every other thing you bring up has to be in service like sub to the initial of macro. It, yeah. Well, the presiding macro question. Yeah, the there presiding. could be other macro questions, and there could right. be many micro ones, yes. but they should be relevant mm -hmm. to the like in the hierarchy. If they're not relevant, then it's like you said, where they either go too much or too little, and so you don't you don't feel satisfied. You don't have your closure. Uh, I believe he uh, gives Oedipus uh, Rex or the king or no, just Oedipus, uh, whatever you. <laughs> Um, and he sh just demonstrates every single question that's raised throughout, mm. but how in the end it all ties back to the initial question that right. was raised. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very fascinating. No, and uh, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Oedipus just in general, so I liked it that he used it as an example because it does do that very well. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is this is kind of the crux of the entire argument. the This idea of micro and macro plots that are happening and how they inform one another. Mm. I think at some later point, which I won't go too much into because I think it happens later, but he says something like uh, the micro plots are really what make up the macro overall. And like, well, you know, the, be, the, but... the closure of all the micro plots are really what leads to the closure sure. of the macro plot. It's not the overall, it's not like, you know, none of this stuff feeds into it. It's the macro plot is, is composed the of them. Yeah, no, all, I get it. You know, the combination of all those. There's a philosophy of language theory that all sentences can be actually broken down to the question and everything in service to the question. And I actually just thought of that right now while we were having mm -hmm. our discussion. Yeah. So I think there's a kind of tie in there that you know everything services that question. Um, and all plot is is inherently tied to like a mystery of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's in a a sense, very... the enigma, if you will, yeah. even if it's not, again, not an outright mystery per se, but that essentially what it boils down to, at least that he argues for, and I would largely agree with. Does anyone have any other points to bring up about too? Uh, well, yes. I'll, let me um, bring one of my favorite quotes. He uses a couple examples, um, as we were just saying, of when it's like irrelevant. And so my favorite one, he's talking about Moby Dick. So the, let's call it the macro questions of Moby Dick, he points out, are, will Ahab and his crew find the white whale? And if they do, will they kill it? Moby Dick answers those questions, and that's all it needs to do. And what I found amusing was, an edit, he writes, an edit chapter about the grand opening of Ishmael's dry goods store in New London would be inappropriate because yeah. it's irrelevant to the plot. Yeah. I just think it was a funny little example, but I, I took his point very well, and it was well made. 
So the third section, or unless you have another one. Nope. nope. The third section is uh, indicatives and interrogatives. In this section, he basically discusses implications and the fact that <laughs> in a plot that uh, he uses film, and I like, I'm going to use uh, the metaphor yes. of film and to really discuss that. Like, to be clear, you mentioned earlier, he's kind of grounded in film, so yes. he uses a lot of those as examples, but sure. But you have a thing where you're seeing a scene that's not necessarily structurally raising a question, but there's could like looking at it in depth, you can, you, you automatically yeah. have questions like the first scene in a, when you first see a shot, you're like, where are they? Uh, what, what time frame is this? Yep. Who is this person on the screen? So it builds up all of these implied questions and that the entirety of, is almost a like a causal nexus. Yes. Which I, th I think he uses right. that yes. exact term. But sure, I mean, I got what he meant, and it makes sense. Again, I agree with that as a proposal of how uh, narratives work and how he uses um, the, the, the the indicatives and so forth, mm -hmm. how they filter into all of that. Yeah, I, I mean, in this section, I, I actually really like his discussion on the films that he mentions that mess with uh, the way that time works, uh, Memento and Irreversible were two of right. them. I knew you would like that section, sure. That he discusses. And the idea that even though the closure in those is had, I mean, so I'm maybe departing a little bit from what he says in here, but kind of reading it between the lines, I guess. The idea that the closure in those is had right away, but you don't realize that it's the closure of the film until later on is a really interesting way to tell a story, I think. Um, mm. He also mentions Time's Arrow, which... Uh, we can get into in a philosophical debate. Yeah, but, or exactly. That's a, a whole other... Debate. But sure. It's a whole other no, story. No, I mean, it's a, it's a narrative device, essentially, in this instance. But, you know, this this is all about... Um, what was the title of it again? Interrogatives and... Or indicatives and interrogatives. Yeah. So, it's kind of all about, like, how those questions come about and and how they're answered sure well i want to point out like you to that point and to the point uh ian just spoke about before um one of the lines i really liked was he writes question formation on the basis of received information is a natural thought process italicized so right like asking those questions well, what time frame is it who is this person etc like you just automatically do that yes and so they sort of when they are answered for you either again in whatever way they are that again builds upon the uh, Getting closer to closure, or you know, it starts the road to closure, if you will. I don't, I don't exactly remember if it's in this section, but he's talking about that and going into kind of how that closure is built, or, or how those questions are built. You know, he yeah. he says like even at the beginning of a story, exactly, even right at the beginning when you're setting up the story, there are questions that right. are exactly. immediately asked, and even he. I think he was trying to at some point say that maybe you don't maybe you think you don't ask yourselves questions about this stuff but right. really you don't they know, are immediately questioned it's for a me. natural thought process how did they I get said. to this place yeah. why how did they end up in these circumstances that they're in when they start you know even so he says like it's very much obvious if uh, something starts in media res but it's not so obvious when it's just the setting that's going on. But sure, exactly. there are immediate questions that are asked that need to be answered by the end of the by the end of the narrative. He also brings up Aristotle again here, yep. which is beginning, middle, and end. And again, he's saying that the definition of beginning and end aren't necessarily how the in the natural language of things. How we right. interpret it's, it's it. It's not the broad meaning as yeah. usually applied. But there's a definite beginning that needs to be established of the beginning of these series of events. Right. That will, and it almost doesn't matter in a way what happened before. Unless it, like, is that beginning should be established sufficient, and be sufficient yes. for the rest of the narrative. Sure. As the end should be sufficient to close off or bookend to the beginning. Right, exactly. So I think that's a... Uh, yeah, Aristotle didn't <laughs> definitely go into all of that, but I think it's a very fair point that he's making, especially in this next section that they're going yes. to do. Um, well, mm -hmm. I'm going to point out, I think you and I both, came when we uh, read it and came across this uh, line, he 
Um, he writes, with respect to these types of narratives, it may be the case that we do not understand the significance of an event for the story unless we know the questions that is either answering or raising, mm. which I thought was an excellent point. Yes. And like you said, like you said, Sivo, you might not even think about that, but of course it's going to be more, more impactful right. when you become aware of it. So that's all. That, that was, I thought, was a rather key point and, again, very well said in this section. So we're moving on to the fourth section, which is on the nature of narrative and its relation to narrative closure. So what this, to me, basically was, was an argument for previous theories he had that established narrative closure. Right. Which is narrative connect- uh, connection. Connections, yeah. Mm-hmm. And which is basically uh, of the old philosophical thought about narrative, which is just uh, the causation. It's a series of causalities. One leads to the other. And it's basically, yeah, it's. Uh, P implies Q, Q implies R, right. R implies S, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, and so on. We'll so, assume you know the rest of the alphabet. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, and that nexus that develops between them. And basically, this is the foundation that this entire theory is built upon. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no, uh, again, I just, I'm just pointing out lines that I thought sort of exemplify and condense the points that he's making. Uh, so the, the one that I picked out for that one, he was, uh, he writes, I contend that narratives are characterizations of sequences of events which are comprised of what I call, in quote, narrative connections. As, and then he goes on to define what uh, elements uh, make up a narrative connection, mm. which I thought was quite well done as well. Is this the five points yep, he makes? exactly. Mm-hmm. I was going to go over them. All right, so, so let's I'll go. do it right go now. Ahead. The disc- one, the discourse represents at least two events and or states of affairs. Two, in a globally forward-looking manner, Three, concerning the career of at least one unified subject. Four, where the temporal relations between events and states of affairs are uh, perspicuously mm-hmm. uh, ordered. And five, where the earlier events in the sequence are at least uh, causally necessary conditions for the subsequent occurrence of events and or states of affairs in the chain of events being described or are a contribution there too. Right. Which is a fancy way of saying P implies Q. <laughs> right. <laughs> So. No, I mean I agree, but again, it's again it's sort of an artifact of reading a philosophical paper on narrative that yeah. yes, he breaks them down, but it's it's still well stated as such. Mm. You know, it's the famous thing, and I, I saw just a quick uh, parallel to SZ in which and Bart has a five scale system as well in that, so it seems like a sort of a a running trend. But either way, as you said, that's basically what he's saying, but it makes sense well enough, and he he even though it seems maybe obvious or. A somewhat of a tautology, he still needs to uh, lay these points out because he's using them to apply to how he defines the narrative connections, which will go back to whether or not you can achieve narrative closure and when it is, when it is achieved and how. Yeah, and I believe in this section is when he kind of breaks down his own argument a little bit as well. Where he tries he to defang to, his critics by perhaps yeah, poking the holes in his own that's argument. Kind of, that's kind of what he does. You know, he, he says, yes, you can make these arguments that for why this isn't why the causation doesn't necessarily have to be as strong, but regardless, there still needs to be causation. There. Exactly. Here, I'll, and the quote I have for that is, mm-hmm. he writes, Nevertheless, although I have weakened the role that causation plays in narrative, it is still the case that causation, very broadly construed, figures in my account, importantly, in the essential identifying features of narrative. Right. Which is perfectly fine. And it basically, he's, co- he's kind of covering his base on that point, is all. Well, I would like to go into an argument later in this okay. uh, guess about uh, the nature of causation in, sure. uh, in narrative. But uh, do anyone else have any further points on nope, the form? Nope, I pointed out the quotes I liked in. Yeah. Let's move on. Not even who shot JR in Dallas? No, I'm too, I'm so, like, yes, it's a good example, <laughs> but I'm, it's so overused that I, that was one of the low points for me in this otherwise great essay. All right, so the fifth section is basically him uh, calling out a critic of his. Yes. No. Scott, would you like to go on? Recent, sure. Well, the very philo- philosophical thing to do, the uh, hip thing, is to slip in an insult to your detractors, like th- those who are against you on your side of whatever issue you're on. And so he does it in this one. He's writing against uh, J. What was his name? J. David. J. David Bellman. Where yeah. he basically says he does not find Bellman's kind of proposal very compelling. He said, you know, it's basically being like you're you're wrong and your your points suck, and here's why, and I'm right. <laughs> Which is a, a common a thing that's known in, in very grandiose language, as it were. But nevertheless, 
that's why he has this section. It was causation versus emotional response being the crux of right. narrative. Instead of, co- instead of right. closure, it's yeah, right, cl- emotional resonance. Or, um, actually, it's a different term. Well, he, he says, uh, as I understand him, he thinks that a narrative, and he's talking about development here, is a description of a sequence of events that completes what he calls an emotional Emotional cadence. cadence. Yes, that's it. Go on. Where an emotional cadence would be something like the catharsis of pity and fear that Aristotle predicts tops off genuine tragedy. And I have to agree with Carol here. Like, I I don't think... Like, in terms of closure, it's difficult to achieve an emotional... What's it's a the, lot more what's subjective. What's the word that I'm trying to think? Of? Like the the emotional resonance, maybe. Yeah, to 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 crest the peak of emotional, you know, of of the emotional cadence without causation being involved. I don't think. I think that one is necessary. The other is, sure. you know, good. If I mean, it's I agree with you because I agree with him. Yeah. I, mean, I think that makes perfect sense. Like his in this case, I think he is uh, completely valid in attacking his detractor because. Maybe we should read uh, Velleman's article itself, but it seems like the point is already shaky to begin with. Right. Okay, so the the last part is the summary, which we've just given to you. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I have a couple, Summarize the summary, but go on. A couple questions that arose to me while reading this, sure. so I'm going to throw out there. Is causation necessary for a narrative? I think causation is necessary for a narrative that includes closure. Yeah, I mean, of course I agree, because that's basically what well, he what, says, too. But What's the opposite of causation? Randomness, uh, I uh, guess. Free will? That, but yeah, that's the do, thing. See, do it devolves, characters have free will? It devolves into a debate about that, of course, which may not, which may be unanswerable. Right. Because in a sense, the creator, the screenwriter, the director, the author is the god of their universe directing the causality of it. I would say sure, that you need... Sure, in theory, but... I would say that you need purposeful causation... To have an effective point of closure to a narrative. Sure, and I, I, I maybe I'll rephrase it and build upon it uh, based on what we just said. He's, um, you can have a story. I think he actually makes this point again, rephrased. Maybe it has emotional cadence or resonance or whatever. Maybe it doesn't, but the story still ends in a logical way. All right. Because of mostly yes, because the causal elements are laid out in such a way that they make sense. Mm-hmm. Right. So it doesn't matter if it affects you or not, as long as the story itself can concludes and again um answers the questions it it raised and posed to you earlier as we said earlier as well so i guess that's my answer to that (laughs) broadly so we got two examples of the crux of the narrative do you uh you both kind of disagree with emotional catharsis i I mean i disagree with it being the the measuring stick by which you need to measure whether or not a story successfully concluded i guess i think that yeah I, I think that you can have a story without emotional catharsis i don't think you can have a story a conclusive story without causation now is there anything else that could be the crux of narrative you think if the there is i can't yeah it's I can, a good if, question if, if not that then what some, really yeah like, that, that would be the question i asked uh those who had that viewpoint what is it then what would you insert in its place yeah, I don't. I don't know. I I can't really think of anything. Perhaps it, like the. I, I I'll say this. <laughs> I think for anything that I'm going to think of right now at this table, you could probably think of a counterexample where that's not the case. Oh, probably. I was going to say like you know some sort of interact like maybe some sort of interaction between the characters of your like whatever they may be of your uh, narrative, but I don't know if that's, I don't even know if you need Maybe. characters well, of a narrative, you know? For the next person who asks us for an essay topic for a paper, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Exactly. So I have a further question. And I brought this one up to you, Scott, earlier off the cast, but he's defining a, he's casting a wide net that needs, uh, that a set of, a large set of, like things that need to be solved for closure to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about accidental macro themes that are developed that weren't the intent of the author, but are addressed? You see it constantly with people who like, I'll just go the after hours crack thing finds messages little and yeah, messages. themes that mm-hmm. probably uh, almost certainly were not intended yeah. uh, for it's like oh, the original work. Sure. Uh, Forrest Gump being racist like that, um, um, that kind of idea, which is, a theme that's developed and never closed out that wasn't intended ever to be closed out. 
but or to be his a theme argument, in the first place. Yeah, but his argument exactly. is that the questions that are raised that cannot be answered by the director or the writer because it was not aware that that was asked. Right. They were never so, right. That's that's basically what my answer was to you, uh, outside, and I'll flesh out here is that sure you can have a work slash a narrative, which the creators went into it intending to address X, Y, and Z theme or whatever it may be. An audience member may get C theme, etc., out of it, and may feel as if it went unaddressed, but it was never like they sort of inadvertently got that or like slapped on to it. There is a above section. And beyond. There is a section of this article that talks about the idea of in and even you know in this case in what he was talking about, he meant an issue that was left unresolved purposefully. Yes. In or order, in order totally to make the audience. Done you know, work for their food, right. work for their meal, like we said earlier. But in this, in this case, even if, even if it was done, if, even if it wasn't purposefully done, I think that it achieves the same state of like, all right, the audience is working this part out on their own. So if this was like a macro statement that they got out of it and it was never intended by the creator whether it be you know a screenwriter or a director or whatever, then it probably won't be an addressed or, or answer. Author, then yeah, it's going to be answered in the audience's head, the person that's actually thinking so, about it. Sure. That's their own form of but closure. Does that define a bad uh, work? Maybe <laughs> it's going to be your. It's like your Goldilocks point you brought up earlier. Yeah. Where is the point in which over analysis that bleeds over? And overwrites at in in fact yes. Thanks, Susan Sunday. <laughs> yes, of course, uh, but yeah, that. But I, I want to. Uh, well, let me answer that question okay. first. And then okay. I don't think that that define. I don't think that makes it a bad work. I or just narratively unsatisfying. I don't think that narrative. makes it anything. I think that leaves you know that that means that an audience member or a, a you know billion audience members doesn't matter or somewhere in between found something in that work that was not intended. So it doesn't make it a good or bad work specifically it can be good or bad because of that well it can but change that's your not, perception of but, it. Sure, but that happening is not what makes it good or bad i'll use an example i guess of one of my favorite authors philip k dick many of his stories intentionally are left open-ended like they they address many of the things but the whole point of them often is to be unresolved in a certain sense and that's why i generally don't like yeah. philip k dick. <laughs> right. they're mysteries that are never actually solved or some of the things are it'd be like the macro question like Basically, if I had to summarize all Phil K. Dick's novels into one theme is, is reality real? And the answer is, I don't know. Nobody, Nobody knows. fucking knows. <laughs> so it's sort of the po- because it's working with that theme, yes, it's a very specific sort of narrow example. But you can apply that to other things kind of broadly. That's where you're saying that X work presents to you this on face value. But, oh, what about these m- micro elements, perhaps? Mm-hmm. The work itself pr- probably almost certainly doesn't address them because that was never its intent. So how much credit should you lend to yourself and on, or the work in which to maybe arrive at an answer and achieve closure if you didn't get it because of something else that you applied on top of it? If I have to work to get closure from someone else's work, <laughs> that's not, but on that point, though, I want, he, Carol brings up Othello, which is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Shakespearean okay. play. And they're discussing uh, Iago, which you have questions about him, but Shakespeare purposefully right, that's almost saying. acknowledges saying, he I am not going to give it. you yes. closure Winks at you as he's yes. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But of course, that's intentional because you can. it's obviously there in the work itself. It's so not the, like, there you go. The very thing you were just complaining about, Ian. Oh, I was just complaining to be a contrarian. <laughs> sure, of course. Uh, okay, so the, my final question, and I actually thought of this while we were doing the discussion, is that I read an article about spoilers and, and how actually people enjoy movies more when they have it spoiled for them because their mind isn't working on the solutions. They can sit back and appreciate Overall, I don't know how much I believe that or not. I don't not. know how much I resent it, <laughs> probably a lot. But I see, I get the point of it, yes. But but if having, uh, is it beneficial to have closure provided to you prior? Uh, I mean, maybe. I guess it depends who you are, of course. Yeah. Obviously, like subjectively, it's always going to be the case. But I guess perhaps as applied to this essay, perhaps it's somehow like satisfying because you know you have your closure already. So maybe, yeah, you're right. You don't have to work for it. But I resent <laughs> 
those people who are so lazy, perhaps I, in general, that they want it, you know, they want to know the answer without having to do invest as much as otherwise would have been required. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like having stories spoiled for me. I like doing the work, I guess, in terms of like watching or yes, reading a story. There's a difference between I us think, and the masses. Well, no, but. I think that there are certain types of people that are built that way, and sure, I guess I get people it. That, or you know, not built like that, but like have have a predilection or whatever. Sure. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. but I don't even want to say that. Yeah, like, have have learned to enjoy stories in specific ways. All right, but I and think like, you're also uh, specifically Scott. You are interpreting it differently. It's not the idea of saying. Like I don't want to work to figure it out. It's saying that I can. I don't have to concentrate on all the as much fine, as hard. Uh, trying to piece together all the details. Yeah, all right. So I, I can sit back and enjoy the journey. I'm not so concerned about where the destination is. I, but guess, I, I, I like it. sitting. Sure. I, I like exactly. trying to figure it out as the, as right. it's going on. I get that point, and you're right. It's probably more solid than I was mockingly making it out to be. So it stands. But I'm probably mostly in Steve-O's camp, in which I want to do at least some of the work. As well, you know, I I, like I want to be feeling, more engaged with a story. I like the feeling of discovery when you're yes, like doing exactly. like doing the mental gymnastics, and then right. you, but then, and then you figure something out, or something is explained to you that you even that you couldn't figure out, and you're like, oh damn, like that was a good job by the writer, and now I yeah. now I get it like, exactly. And so, that that thing clicks in the middle of a movie. So I, I don't apolo- want, I don't want that click beforehand. You know, I apologize to all our listeners who have had uh, <laughs> Stuff this uh, work spoiled for them. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I just assume you've seen the work. But either way, like, it still stands. And yeah, I agree with it mostly. It's just that, sure, maybe you enjoy in um in engaging with the story in such a way. I just do not, and I don't. I don't see the appeal of it to me. But I get why people might. Is all. Yeah, I mean, I can. And I can see it both. I guess ways. My, one of my last points is I wanted to make is that it sort of ties in that. You're still it's still getting the answer to the questions that it may pose. You're just getting them a bit earlier, perhaps, or right. you know what the, you know what the answers are to whatever questions well, are about to be like, posed. Well, it's like it's like getting the answers before you know the question. Yeah, exactly. and then and so when you the and then when you find out the question, it kind of it's kind of a letdown because you haven't actually had to try to get the answer. Sure. you know. So I was gonna say it, it just to me that sort of devalues um, a story versus going into it the other way. What do you think, Ian? I'm not bothered by it. Like again, if I hear a spoiler or something like that, it's fun. I I do a lot of research anyway. I consider mm-hmm. right. the work. You're gonna try to engage with it regardless, in, sure. But you know, like for instance, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan. Mm. I will look up like who was on set on what days and what the likely and listen to people exactly, uh, yeah. pr- predictions over what's going to happen. Yeah, that has potential for spoilers, but that's a certain different type of work. Sure. That you yeah. put into it. I get it. You, you know, you know the risk. You're Although I will, sense. I will point out that you have uh, disliked spoilers in terms of like game trophies before, as in conversations we had before, specifically in Diablo. Yes, that's true. Three. So I guess it's, I guess it's perhaps a depends somewhere in the him. middle for you. That, I didn't have to work. I accident. It was accidentally spoiled. Right. Yeah. So that's you weren't a, actively seeking them out, which is yeah. a big difference. Sure. So did you find satisfactory closure in? Carol's narrative closure. <laughs> I, in fact, did. I think he, you know, he laid out his points very well about closure and closed off his essay with a satisfactory amount of, if not narrative closure. Because he, he, just be clear, like, again, less facetiously, he does make a point that you can have rhetorical closure, other kinds of closure. Mm-hmm. So, yes, because this was an essay, he basically was laying out points and then uh, filling them out, fleshing them out. And I think he did a good job of giving his vision and thesis about narrative closure and closing and yeah i think he did i really enjoyed the essay i think that there is a lot more to be said about closure and i'm sure that he has said it being you know a professor um i'm sure that he has said a lot more about closure in his in his day and perhaps there's more to read but i think that for a 15 page essay this was this did say a lot and it was was very it was really good material i agree with that um so yeah, I, I I did enjoy reading it. It was a quick read, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was smart. It made me inspired to read more by him, mm-hmm. and also his uh, contractors. Yeah. So this is uh just this is my kind of philo- philosophical essay. Yeah. So, so thanks. Yeah. Uh, Good looks. PKR bar movie. PKR bar movie. 
appreciate the uh we'll do some more the tip all right well i'm jonathan e. Mancer here with steven Musu. have a good night and scott the... and now we have achieved narrative closure <laughs> good night good night This has been the Neophytes of Narratology. We hope that you've experienced an epiphany or two of the literary nature, but only metaphorically, of course. Music by Christopher Morgan. Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Menzer. <laughs>